invite, amen, uh, my parents to come on stage and Minister Wayne to join us on stage this service. Clap your hands for them, everybody. They're going to come and help us talk through some of our conversations about uh, healthy relationships, amen. Right, so we are, as you can uh, imagine, if you're hanging out with us for the first time, for the last six weeks or so, we've been going through a series on healthy relationships. And we've been attempting to think about what does it mean for us to have relationships that are healthy, that are life-giving, uh, all across the spectrum of the relationships that we have, appreciating that some of us will be in marriage relationships and partnerships with folks. Some of us may be single, but still have other meaningful kind of relationships. Others of us may be operating in relationships in re as relates to our jobs or uh, individuals, family members. And so we thought that before we bring our speakers up for today, that we would at least inject a few more ideas into what lessons are we learning uh, through this series on healthy relationships. And so uh, I'm excited. Uh, we did a bit of this conversation in our earlier service and, and uh, you know, things are always better a second time around. Amen. And so you guys, hopefully you'll get a chance to get some great experience, but just introduce yourselves real quick and let us know who you are. And then uh, we'll start with a little bit of a conversation. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. I, uh, I'm James McBride, and uh, I, my relationship began with this lady here in uh, June the 3rd, 1972, and it's been wonderful ever since, amen. I, I've learned over the years to love her, do my best to kiss her every morning, and say I'm sorry when I mess up. <laughs> So I just thank God for the relationship that uh, the, wife, the Lord Jesus Christ has given me and my wife. Uh, God has blessed us with uh, six children. And now we have 12 grandchildren, one on the way. And I honor God for that. You know, as we said earlier, my wife had shared with you that uh, I did grow up in a um, domestic violence type situation, watching my father, you know, be out of control in some areas. And when I was a little boy, I looked at that situation. And I said, when I get me a wife, I'm going to make sure nothing happens to her. She won't have to worry about that other craziness because I'm going to make sure she have a house and have everything she want to eat. Amen. <laughs> and I thank God that he's helped me thus far. I thank God for her. Amen. And, of course, uh, you know my son, Michael. Amen. <laughs> so, uh, He's been a good part of our lives also, but I just thank God for the relationship that uh, I have with my wife and, and with God uh, because that's why I'm here. I have to say that every time I'm up, I'm here because of Jesus Christ, and I know that. See, that's, that's what makes it so real for me, but then he gave me some uh, partner like this lady that helped me look pretty good today. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> So God bless you, amen. All right. <laughs> well, I thank, thank you God. for making him look pretty good today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have a, um, a, a one son, um, Ben, that's colorblind, and, and his wife, Janelle, is always telling me that they don't know how to match. So, <laughs> so we have a common thread of... of <laughs> but I really thank God for being here. Um, we have uh, come a long way. My parents are also... Um, overcome by domestic violence, and we often had to get between my mom and dad who had knives trying to slice each other up. Um, police had to come to the house and, and take my dad and escort him out. And so when we first got engaged, we made a decision that that wasn't going to be the story of our marriage. And that's what brought us together to Christ was we said, if, if your dad was trying to cut your mama and my dad was trying to cut my mom, we need to go get some help. Mm -hmm. And so before we even started seriously uh, considering getting married, we came to the church. And the church grounded our foundation. It gave us a sense of... of uh, patience with each other and, and learn how to pray for each other and it, because I know our time is short I'm a, can I interject my well, please. Oh, right so how do you tell your mom no in front of you 
Yeah. That's the great <laughs> risk. Of, no. Not this close to Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so when, hey man, Lord. <laughs> That's the real deal. <laughs> so one, one of the um, things that helped us, we went to a marriage counseling uh, with the Clevelands that Mike had provided for us, and we took a marriage test, and we got 50%, which was, this was like three years ago. And one of the things that caused us to have a low score was the fact that we don't communicate on real issues. So the Clevelands counseled us, and that's why I know even us, we need counseling. Counseling helps you to find your blind spots. And so they told us there are three things we could do to improve our communication. And I shared these with Mike and, um, and Sharice uh, in a conversation we had earlier this week, and they're the three A's. One is apologizing to each other whenever you think that there's a bit of tension between each other, even if you're not the originator of, this, of the um, altercation, just the fact that you started the apology conversation going benefits your relationship. And another is to um, ask for um, prayer for each other in the morning. And when you get up, ask the other one, because somebody's going to be out of sorts. It's just how life goes. So you ask the other, can I pray for you that you have a blessed day? And then you pray for me. So that ask and then that apologizing. The third one is affirming each other. And that's making sure that you find three things to say positively to your mate. I don't care if it's texting, in person, um, if it's something that you, you have another form of communication on Facebook, blasting them out and saying, look how handsome my man looked today. You know, find some way of sending affirmation to them because the world whips it out of you and we the people that love on you, whether they're your husband, whoever they are, they need to have a way of it getting back into them. So spiritual affirmation, positive um, physical ones. Women love to be told we're beautiful. I don't care what our, if it's a bad hair day, we need to hear it even more so. You know, so we just need affirmations on the physical, the, po the um, other areas of our lives so that we can always know that someone loves us. Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 yes. It is. 47 years, 47 years of being able to work it out. Hallelujah. Now, we, we also thought it'd be great to have uh, Wayne uh, give us some of his um, growth and learnings as a single father who's raising <laughs> um, some amazing uh, kids. So just talk a little bit about your journey and, and what this series has been doing and the things that you've been learning along the way. Hey, hey, okay, we on. Um, yeah, this this series. Um, Sorry, that was me. It's all good. It really has brought up um, this this thought of continuing my inner work. Um, what I've come to learn um, along this journey of life, I, as a young man, I mean, uh, as a boy at two years old um, in New York, I experienced my father um, doing domestic abuse to my mother. Um, and my mother ended up leaving him, fleeing, and we ended up going to Little Rock, Arkansas for a little while, and then we got here. I got two older brothers. Um, and I kind of made a vow, um, just like Deke, like, man, I don't want my kids to have to experience that, you know? Um, so when I have kids, um, I, I, you know, I reunited with my father after 40 years last year. And um, what I love, thank you. What I'm learning is everybody got a story, man, you know? <laughs> so, you know, while I carried a lot of hurt and pain for a long time after getting with that man and understanding his story, man, I, I mean, I had already forgiven him and given him grace before I even contacted, connected with him, you know? But um, it really pushed me into this wanting to be a great father. But I was doing a, doing, a, doing a pretty good job at being a good father, but it wasn't until I started going to church and like, put my head in that Bible and start following the followings of Christ, that my inner work really started to happen. You know, I started to really be able to identify who I'm supposed to be. You know, I didn't have a real identity until I understood my identity in Christ. And so once I understood my identity and that I wasn't, because I was, I was horrible in the streets before I met Christ, and so I thought that made my identity. You know, so what I had to offer my kids, um, it, was, it, was, it was limited. You know, um, and so I've had to do this journey of inner work, therapy, and just my own self stuff, um, emotional healing, um, mental healing. Um, you got to do all of this inner work, but 
I mean, I was a product of my environment. I ain't, I ain't had no man, men around me talking about no inner work, no emotional healing, no, we didn't hear, I didn't know the word trauma, like really understand it until about five years ago. My community ain't talking about that. You know, we, we out here practicing like this masculinity that's just, I'm tough and I'm, no, nah, man, we around here broken, you know what I'm saying? So um, it's been a journey and, and, and like a lot of my friends say, once I get a grip of anything, I go hard. And so once I understood that this wasn't my identity, that this nickname they called me in the streets, this, 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 this person who acts tough, this wasn't my identity, that God saw me as his son and Jesus Christ died for me and there was a better me in me, I had to start digging into that and seeing what that was about. And that took me on this journey of just a whole bunch of healing, a whole bunch of becoming better. And my kids blessed my life because they were a part of teaching me how to love at a new level. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you know, what, one of, the, one of the, the, the things that we try to do here is accentuate the need for uh, community, therapy, um, have, have folks that can speak into your relationship in ways that can give you prayerfully uh, godly counsel, um, knowing that even once you get the counsel, it's still up to us to ensure that we take heed and, and practice it. Uh, what are some of the lessons that you've learned in your counseling um, over the years that have helped uh, you both all, uh, in your various relationships to be more healthy, do uh, the inner work as, as Wayne has, has stated? Uh, any, any quick things you wanna share about, about that? I know you've mentioned a few of those already, but. Yeah. Well, for me, the, um, the most important thing deals with the commandments that God gave us about love one another. I find that if you, uh, even in the midst of trauma in an evolving relationship, can still find grace to love someone in the midst of their developing in a person that you can have in your life, you still need to love them and to forgive them. I don't believe in forgive and forget. I believe in forgive. Because I believe if I forget, I might let you do that to me again. So I believe in forgive and then remember <laughs> so that you don't let yourself get in that kind of negative relationship. My again, ladies, do I have an amen? <laughs> Yeah. So, well, br yeah. br brothers, do I have another? <laughs> 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 All right. But, but amen. Just, just learning to continue to love because in the midst of our loving, that's how we change people's lives. All right. All right. One other, one other area, too, that um, really has helped me is I, I, I grew up on 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter. I read in my relationship, my time with Loretta. And that is, you know, love suffers long, but it's kind. And having a, a forgiving spirit and a spirit to know when you messed up, you're able to go to your loved one, I'm sorry, honey. Will you forgive me, help me along the way? It's been easy for me. And I thank God for that, you know, because I, I had another kind of attitude there for a while, but thanks be to God, I let the, for me, I have to let the scriptures kind of work. I, the scriptures got to carry me. Yeah. That's how I came to Christ, was through the word. So I, the word carried me in areas that helps me to want to in more. All right. <laughs> All right. Get in the room. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Man, that girl stayed back in and whatnot. Yeah, what, yeah. What, what you learned, Wayne? <laughs> I got you. I got you. Um, you know, two things came up in my mind. He's up here showing off. Yeah, you know. <laughs> two things came up in my mind. Something I've really learned in this journey is that love is not a feeling. Love is sacrifice. Um, and, and a lot of us don't. I never thought of love as that. I thought it was something I felt made me feel all bubbly. It was all about me, really. Love ain't, ain't all about us. It's about this selflessness of sac being sacrificial with the way you treat people and the way you think about people and the way things you do, you know? And so my kids have definitely, my daughter that stays with me, my 17-year-old daughter, I was sitting in her room the other night and I was like, girl, you taught me how to love for real. Because the grace I done had to get that girl, like, Lord. <laughs> Lord knows, you know. But the other thing I've really learned on this journey is be graceful with yourself. Because God is graceful with you. So a mentor told me, he said, son, if you're not being graceful with yourself, then you're playing God. And that stuck with me. Like, I tell my kids all the time, 
the most important conversations you'll ever have is the ones you have with yourself. And so when you talk, and I, I was reading something on depression the other day, and it said that depression is just the bad conversations you have with yourself. And so I'm learning to be graceful with myself. Sometimes it feels wrong because I'll be like, man, I, I get to receive grace just like this. I just messed up. But that is the grace of God. And you got to learn how to have, have grace with yourself because if you don't have grace with yourself, then you can't have grace for other people. And you can't love other people, you know? So those are, those are the big two takeaways on my journey that I really learned and tried to master. Well, I just want to appreciate them offering their gifts and their, their voices uh, to this conversation. You know, they're all kind of relationships uh, that we are all struggling to live into and be much more uh, mindful about. And we thought um, that this would just be a, a great opportunity just to hear a little bit. and. We know that all the relationships on stage aren't exhaustive. We, we, we have same gender relationships and we have relationships with um, our, 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 our uh, um, you know, uh, I don't call them mixed families, but you know, uh, blended families, you know, and, and th they're all complex, right? And so I just think it's really important for us to, to uh, keep remembering that the journey towards healthy and whole relationships is always about staying on the journey um you know you're never gonna arrive um you just always have to keep walking together and and i love the words theological words that were used grace love peace forgiveness these are all practices within our tradition that i want you all to deeply interrogate uh, as we continue to think about how we can be more healthy and whole in all of our relationships. Is that all right, everybody? So I appreciate these folks. I called them last night, and I thank God that they said yes. Let's clap our hands one more time for these great folks joining us on stage. Love you. Now, as we're winding down our relationship series, we certainly wanted to have some folks come and, and keep sharing and uh, offering us some great wisdom. And uh, these are some amazing friends of our church. Uh, you may have experienced uh, at least one half of their ministry. Pastor Corey was here uh, blessing us during our Easter uh, uh, panel conversation about uh, what does it mean for uh, things to be made brand new and, and for a resurrection to happen in every part of our lives. And uh, we've been walking together for the last few years. Uh, they are wonderful, wonderful people. They are uh, planting and, and, and launching a new ministry over on the other side of the, of the, the East Bay in uh, the Livermore, Pleasanton, Dublin area uh, called Mercy Side Church. And uh, we are super excited to have them to just come and share some of their lessons around relationships and things that they've learned over the years. Uh, I like their, um, their uh, wisdom because their wisdom is not just uh, kind of the grounded in, in everything that was great, but they give a wonderful expression of the ups and downs of relationships. And uh, I think it will be a great blessing uh, for all of us to just glean from them uh, some of the word of God and the wisdom that they will share. So I'd love for all of us to please stand to your feet and let's welcome the spokespeople for the King of Glory today, Pastor Corey and Julie Leak as they come. Thank you guys for having us. These, these are different stools than last, last time. This is nice. Still got a little bounce to it. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're really glad to be here. And, and I want to say, like, right off the top, that one of the reasons I'm really glad to be here, we're, we're always, my family is always blessed to be at the way. I've been saying a lot lately, if you've not heard the gospel from a traditionally oppressed people group, then you haven't heard the gospel. If you've not heard that sound that comes from people who've had to struggle and fight uh, to gain their footing in the world and, and, and know what it sounds like to have those people hope that God is taking them to a promised land and you haven't heard the gospel. So every time I get to be here all the way from Livermore where uh, we don't necessarily get to hear that gospel all the time, um, it's always, it's always, always great. And, and today, as Pastor Mike said, um, we just want to talk to each other and and talk to you and talk about our experiences. Uh, relationships are tough. They're hard. It's 
they're not necessarily all that complicated to be healthy, but it's still hard to do even once you get the information. And so if you're in this room, right off the bat, if you're in this room right now and you're single or you're divorced or you, um, you, you've been through some difficult things in relationships, I just want you to know there's hope for you um, and there's no condemnation for you because life is hard and relationships will whoop our tails, all right? Um, and so we, we are certainly no experts and so we don't have PhDs. Uh, we have PhDs in each other. We've been married 20 years as of November 6th. And, um, you know, we've been married so long that I can, I remember this November 6th all the time. I used to kind of get confused between the 2nd and 6th. And so I'd, I'd say, yeah, we've been married. We, our anniversary is November and I'll look at her. But now I got it. I got it locked in. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so anyway, um, we, we want to talk. And one last thing I'll say before we get started. Uh, we didn't do this last service. We may do it this service. Uh, we may talk about some pretty heavy things, uh, adult things, internet type things, if, if, if you're catching what I'm saying. Uh, because that is something that plagues and affects relationships and, 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 and spans so many different types of relationships and has uh, long lasting effects. So we may get into some of that just to give you a warning. We'll be talking about that in case that's triggering for anyone. Uh, I just want you to be prepared to know that we are. We want to talk about some real stuff today, all right? Uh, so that being said, this is my beautiful wife, Julie. Julie, do you want to say some stuff to the people? As Corey said, we always love being here, and we have with us our three beautiful daughters. They will not stand, so, but it's Amaya, Morgan, and Gabrielle. They're 17, 16, and 13, and I have a lot of gray hair. Let's just put it that way. Let's just, let's just leave it right there. <laughs> no. But we do love being here, and most Sunday mornings when we wake up, Mom, can we go to the way? Can we go to the way? And they don't drive yet, so Corey and I are like, that's too far. <laughs> so, but anyway, we do love being here, and we do appreciate you having us, Pastor Michael. So, Yeah, so what, what we decided to do, and, and I, we talked about this yesterday, I said, baby, it would be great if, like, we just pick some questions and ask each other without telling each other what we were going to ask each other. And my wife said, are you crazy? So she's going to ask me some questions that I don't know what she's going to ask unless she asked something from last service. But I, I, I told her what I'm going to ask her because she's like, don't put me on the spot like that because, you know, we, we, won't, we may not make it 21 if you put me on the spot in front of all these people. Okay. So um, my, my first question for you um, is sort of, well, actually, you know what? I want to do this. We did the last service and I, I want to do this now. I, wanna, I want you guys to talk for a little bit to each other. Uh, about who is a, a celebrity couple or a maybe a couple growing up like the Cosbys that like is a is a couple that like you looked at and were like I really like their relationship. So you take a couple minutes and tell each other that before we before we get started. All right, so I bet you we got some uh, Huxtables out there. Any Huxtable fans out there? Um, we got Marge and Bart Simpson. Anybody Marge and Bart? No? Good times. Um, the Jeffersons, surely. Will and Jada and their open relationship. I mean, come on. What are we talking about here? They don't have an open relationship no more? Their, their relationship is definitely open. It's open. Somebody said it's rumor. It's definitely open. I don't care what y'all said. Um, we have uh, anybody. Let's see. There's Sierra and, and um, Russell Westbrook. Wilson, not Westbrook. I'm about to mess up their marriage. Okay, let me get back. Let's get back to church because I'm out here. I'm, I'm going to start saying crazy stuff, and I don't, we don't need to do that today, okay? Um, so. Well, before we get started, ahead. I will say that our daughters, after the first service, they said, um, they told us who their couple is, and it is Mr. and Mrs. McBride. They love your relationship. <laughs> so it is possible you just gained three more grandchildren, just so you know. <laughs> okay, so tell people uh, what, is, what has been super annoying about being married to me for the last 20 years <laughs> and how you've had to deal with us. So it can be fun or serious, whatever. Just tell, tell them that just to start with. Well, I'll go fun. I to we told the first service that, or I told the first service that one of the things that has driven me crazy is 
Corey will take off his socks every night or every day. When he gets home, he balls them up. And no, he doesn't put them in the dirty clothes. He just throws them. Just literally, just will toss them. And he's sitting there watching TV or whatever. And there's literally a trail of socks from our living room to the bottom of the stairs. He may sometimes walk to the bottom of the stairs and throw them to the top of the stairs. And it just drives me nuts. And he says the reason why he does it is because... Well, because I, I, sometimes I might need those socks and I don't want to have to go to the drawer to get them. Like, you know, if I'm just, so they're like readily... They're right there. Like, sometimes you get floor. dressed, you, come, you can't wear shoes in the house. So we don't sometimes wear you shoes might in the house. come downstairs and you're like, oh man, I forgot socks. No, I didn't. They're right here. So, you know, that's... No lie to tell, we do have socks. And I refuse to pick them up. I'm not picking up your socks that you just threw. So that's... I love you, but it's annoying. <laughs> Was there anything else like, that you had to learn to like cope with and deal with because that I may change that today I might go home and pick up all my socks probably not but I'm I, but anyway is there something that you've had to learn like I just got to deal with that personality wise or whatever so Corey and I are very different we are he's extroverted I'm introverted um, I don't usually do this so um, but through the years from the from very early on I I don't get a lot of joy all the time being around a bunch of people it's draining to me emotionally. It's a little stressful. I gotta mentally prepare myself. I will oftentimes find a way out of um, being around a lot of people. And that is not Corey. So he's very extroverted, loves people, gets energy from people. Um, I, I also like people, so I don't want it to come across that I don't like people, but it's just, it's a lot of work for me. If I've been out all day doing something, I cannot wait to get home and I have to just debrief, like chill, because it was a lot of work. And so I've had to like learn that even though it's hard for me and it's pulling and it's draining and it's a lot of work to be in spaces that are energizing for him, I have to learn to say, I can't just pull him into my space and pull him and insist that, well, we don't have to go there today because I don't want to, or why can't you just understand and we not do all these things? I also have to, to understand that he, that's something that he needs. And though it may be frustrating to me a lot of times, I have to also understand that it is life-giving to him. And so that's been something that's been hard and frustrating, but also. Yeah, and you've done a really good job with it. Thank you. you know, and you have put up with more stuff with me than I have put up with you, for sure. Uh, and and I, I think it's, it's a really important lesson to learn because, you know, when you are in a relationship, it, it doesn't matter just if it's marriage. If you're in any sort of relationship, you are bringing something to that relationship that, like, is yours. You brought it with you. Uh, and, and both people involved in a relationship are doing that, so it's important to make space for the stuff that got brought uh, that has nothing to do with you. It becomes very easy to take things personally that I really don't have anything to do with you, and we'll probably get into some of that later, but um, you know, we've, we've both sort of had to make those adjustments and, and without penalizing each other for it. You know how like you'll, you'll do something for somebody, you know, like fine, I'll do it, and then you, in your mind, you, you, just, you, know, you just went up in the scoreboard. So next time it comes up, you know, last time I decided not to hang out with people, but the next three times we gotta hang out with people because it's, you know, it's my turn, and I think if you can learn to be people in relationships that are not penalizing each other, that you truly love each other, that you go, I'm making a sacrifice for you because I love you and I'm not keeping score of it. I'm just doing it because I love you. Um, this is a, you don't know this question or you don't know I'm asking you this question. Um, what does it mean to you to leave and cleave? And what was the hardest part about doing that? Because I know it's hard. Um, I know you think I'm gonna say it's because I'm a mama's boy. That's what you want to hear me say. <laughs> because I did hug my mom for a long time and weep on our wedding day. It was sobbing. It's a terrible picture of, of me. Um, so, I mean, yeah, that might have been hard, leaving mom. I think, um, gosh, that's such a good question. I should maybe should not have had you ask me stuff I didn't know you was going to ask me. Uh, leaving and cleaving is, it, for me, is it is that I have decided, or, or any person that gets involved in a relationship has decided that I am leaving everything behind. Uh, in order to be in this relationship, and that this relationship matters more than anything else. And when we made wedding vows, my wife, my wife and I, early on in our marriage, were 
having this huge blow up. I mean, this was a fight, a, a fight among all fights. I, I was driving, she was uh, over in the passenger seat yelling at me and I was yelling back. I should have pulled over. It was dangerous how much we were fighting, okay? And y'all, some of y'all look too like religious, act like y'all ain't never fought like that. Y'all fought like that on the way here today. And y'all act like, uh, we don't. I don't know what that, you fought like that? What do you mean? You guys need help. No, you, you know what I'm talking about. So we, we had this, this knockdown, dragged out, you know, argument and, and she said to me, words I'll never forget, she said, you said that you would forsake all others and everything for me. And I don't remember if I said it out loud, but I know I thought it, yeah, but I didn't know you was gonna hold me to that. Like that was kinda what I thought, I was such a jerk, but that's what I thought and felt at the moment. And, and, and I think sometimes we make vows, we make commitments, and they're words to us. But when the rubber meets the road, and there's a career opportunity that your partner doesn't wanna go on, uh, and you have to decide, am I gonna say yes or no to that because this is first. If this is truly first, then career has to come second. And other relationships have to come second. And, and you know, that, that you didn't know that, that your friend from college was gonna come back looking that good, and, and you, you didn't know, you know, you didn't know that. And I'm not talking about me, I'm more talking about other people, okay? I want you to be very, I want to be very clear about that, okay? <laughs> I'm not talking about me. I don't, have, I, need, I don't have any college friends that came back from anywhere, okay? I don't even know nobody but you, really, all right? So, um, I forgot what I was saying. Um, so there, there's a commitment that you make and you have, to, you have to stick to it. So I think to me, the leaving and cleaving is I've left everything behind, all my ambition, all this. Not, not that I'm not ambitious, not that I don't have dreams, not that I don't want to do things, but it's that this is first. And if it can't be first, I think that's why Paul in, in the scriptures talks about what he encourages people not to get married. And I think part of that encouragement not to get married is because marriage is a commitment. And if you are people who are being persecuted and you're, and you're, and you're really deeply struggling, there, there is Paul's admonition in them is, hey, it's better off being like me. Because I'm, I'm going all over Greece and I'm going to get beat up and I'm going to get put in jail and I'm have, they're going to sick lions on me. And, and I, it's better that you be that way because the commitment to marriage is first and foremost. And for me, that's what leave and cleave means. So that's you. Okay. What has been the most surprising part of being married in general, not just you know, in general? Um, one of the things that has been most surprising, well, not most surprising, but one of the things that has been surprising is learning to balance um, between, we had kids very young, like two years into marriage was when she was born. And the the most is how difficult balancing would be between parenting and having a relationship that comes first, but then also when you bring kids into the world or into the marriage of figuring out um, like how to balance it all, how to balance work and making sure that we keep this most important, but we have kids that are also very important, especially when we got into teenage years. I'm st we're still learning this balance thing that I thought would just be a little bit easier, that it would be, well, now I that I have a partner with someone to do this thing with, it would be a whole lot easier, and it's surprising to me on a regular basis how difficult it is, and making sure that at the end of the day, which I think is sometimes even hard for our teenage kids to understand that we do come first. You are important. Don't get it, don't get that wrong. You are very important. But right now, it's mom and dad. And you'll appreciate it later. But. Yeah, I mean, because they, and they would probably attest to the fact there's many times at 9 p.m. we're like, go upstairs, you know, <laughs> and, and, and it's, yeah, I mean, there's, you have to have mommy, daddy time. Um, whatever that means to you, you have to have that <laughs> in order to have a healthy, a healthy relationship and healthy marriage. Well, going along with that, I, I want to ask you, what do you think are two or three of the most important things that need to be present in your marriage in order for it to be successful? Not happy, but successful. Hmm. Um, I think a, um, a therapist. Oh. Um, and we... We had, a, we had a very, very tough year around, I think, year nine or 10. Um, and we were also broke. And, you know, I remember being like, well, we can't afford counseling. And it dawned on both of us that, well, if my car breaks down, 
I can't just tell my boss I can't come to work because I can't afford to get my car fixed. Like, and my marriage is far more valuable than my job or my car. And so if I would find a way to make that work, I can find a way to make counseling work. And so we you know, decided that early, early on then that we needed help and we needed to learn uh, how to communicate, which I guess would be the second thing, is that um, counseling taught us how to talk about anything. And it taught us, we could actually be in, a, in an argument right now in front of y'all and you would not know it. We learned how to do that. Before we know how to do that, you would know he's in an argument from miles away. Okay, but now we've learned how to communicate about some very, very tough and delicate things and we've also learned uh, that sometimes you don't get to resolve everything. Like when you're in it, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. Sometimes there's this, there's this term that we use often, we just need to shelve that. We, it's, we're gonna put that on the shelf, we're gonna, we're gonna love each other, we're gonna put that on the shelf, we're not gonna talk about that thing anymore, we're not gonna bring that up until we're ready to talk about it again or taking it back to counseling. And then I guess the last thing is, the McBrides covered it earlier, is that both people have to be willing to apologize. This is any relationship. Yeah. Like any relationship, that, whether it's at work, whether it's on social media, and we, you, know, you know this, this doesn't happen on social media. I can't remember the last time I saw somebody having a heated social media debate, and somebody was like, you know what, I'm sorry, I was wrong about that. <laughs> you know, it, that just doesn't happen in our culture. And so what, especially with this younger generation that's coming up, they're learning to live a lot through social media, and if they're learning uh, that, that the only way human beings interact with each other is yelling and screaming and nobody backing down, that's only gonna feed into their actual relationships. And it's important that in every relationship that you are willing to say you're sorry, even if you have to say it through gritted teeth, that you learn how to say, my bad. I didn't tell you about this one. I'm, I'm, it, but it's easy. I promise it's easy. It's kind of easy. Um, we've been married for 20 years. And so when I, I used to you know, come across people who've been married for a long time, I always ask them, like, what, you know, how do you do that? What's the secret to being married for 20 years for you? And a lot of people said it was, quite honestly, you go over there and I go over here, which I know is not your answer, okay? Um, at least I hope not, okay? But we've been married for 20 years. What would you say are one or two things that have helped us to, like, from your perspective, to stay married? Uh, we really are great friends. And it's important to both of us that we spend time together. Um, we, we are... We're, we're together a lot right now. We both work from home, and so it, it becomes easy to be together, be in the same room together a lot. We are together a lot. But we've made it, we are intentional about dates. We just are. Our kids get annoyed. You just hung out all day. Why do you got to go on a date? Is that how you sound? No. <laughs> but we are very intentional about dating on a regular, almost weekly basis. It is important to us. We're grateful that we're now at the stage where we don't need a babysitter, so I know that that can be hard for, for some parents to, to make that a priority because you know, it, it's expensive to hire a babysitter, but we are thankfully at the stage where we don't need a babysitter, so we can go anytime we want to. We can go overnight if we wanted to, praise the Lord. Um, so that's been one of the most important things for us is we, we make time to have fun together and spend time together, and then we also spend a lot of time communicating and asking questions of the other person. So we do fight and we do argue, but we really try to work on listening in our communications and hearing and acknowledging the other person's feelings. Um, we were just talking about something last night that I brought to Corey that was turned out to be all the wrong time, probably not said the right way, but I was, I was only able to hear that and know that by listening to him. So we make it a priority to really try and listen to, which has really helped, I think. Yeah, that's a great answer. And you, you just said something that I, I, wanna, I, wanna, I wanna like hang uh, this moment on, and it's the word invest. Um, because I think, and we've just sort of mentioned it twice with the counseling and with a, a babysitter, um, you won't have a healthy relationship with anyone that you don't invest in that you don't invest your time, and that you don't invest your money and your resources in. You know, it, it, it may put a line item in your budget for babysitter if you don't have kids old enough to stay at home on their own. Put a line item in there for, for you may be fine right now, put a line item in there for counseling because you will need it. Sometimes you need it for help, sometimes you just need it for maintenance. Uh, but it's important that you, that you have that, uh, that you invest in your, your relationship. 
What comes to mind when you hear boundaries in marriage? You asked me this last service, and, and, and I told you that it's triggering for me. The, the word boundaries, because when we got married, early on in our marriage, when we had this rough period, we, we got this book by Robert and somebody else, Townsend, the, the counselors, and the book was called Boundaries in Marriage. And we were, this was our like inexpensive way of, we, we don't go, we're not gonna go to a counselor yet, we're just gonna read this book together. So we tried to read this book together, and every time we opened it up and read, we started fighting. We just, we would just argue. It'd be like, the, the book would say something, I'd be like, no, I'm not doing that. And then we go back and forth, why aren't you doing that? Well, I'm not doing it until you do like, it. Like, see, do you see what they said in there? I told you. <laughs> so like we were, we were beating each other up with this book. And so when I hear boundaries in marriage, it's the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, but in all seriousness, boundaries uh, in any relationship is, is super important because the, the next thing that comes to mind and, and that we actually did read in this book that was really helpful is that there's, like I said earlier, there's stuff that you bring into a relationship and there's stuff that the other person brings into a relationship. And it's important that you recognize what's mine and what's yours. Where does my uh, emotional trauma end and where does yours begin? Because we all enter into relationships with emotional trauma. Her and I, I, I was raised in an abusive home where my stepdad was abusive. And you can tell this story later, or, or I can say it now, my, you were raised in a relationship with drug addict parents. So for both of us, bringing that trauma into a relationship is like where, when you get married, you're, you're becoming one, but that trauma becoming one is really messy because I'm blaming you for stuff that is actually my dad's fault. Amen. Or actually another relationship or actually something else that happened that has nothing to do with you. So when you come to me and bump up against that trauma, my reaction to you is actually not to you, but at that point, it's too late for anybody to recognize that. So it gets so entwined. And I think until you learn to like sort of step back and be emotionally, hel emotionally healthy enough to do your own work and to evaluate what is it in me that keeps getting triggered when this happens. If my socks at the bottom of the stairs cause my wife to go upside my head with a wooden spoon, that's not the socks fault. That's just that, and, the, and oftentimes in a marriage, it's in, in relationships, we, we, we act like it's the, the small thing's fault. If, if I throw a pebble into the ocean and I get a tsunami back, that's not the pebble. There was something already in the water, something that had nothing to do with the pebble. And when you have these blow-ups at people, it's very, it's, it feels good to blame them. It really does. But oftentimes, that's not, that's not them. There's something inside you that you need to address. Okay. Um, we had a very, very uh, difficult time in our marriage, really hard early on. We first got married. Um, I, in full disclosure, uh, this, is this recorded somewhere that's going out on the internet? For all of you watching online, um, um, I had an issue with the internet um, and we had to work through that. And I, don't, I know that that had an impact on you. And I, wanted to just, I want you to just talk about what that was like for you as a spouse of someone who was struggling with something that, that heavy. How did you work through that? What did you learn? What have you gained from that experience? Yeah, that was a, it was a tough time that took years for us to work through, um, lots of counseling. And one of the things that I still to this day hear one of my counselors saying, and she said it pretty, at, at the moment I was like, oh, that hurt. Like, but she looked at me and said, it's not about you. And as much as, and I, it, in that moment, I felt like she didn't hear the pain that it caused me, but she wasn't, she wasn't not hearing the pain that it caused. She was letting me know, as Corey mentioned earlier, this isn't about you. This is an issue that he brought into the marriage that yes, is painful. And yes, you have to work through and yes, you, I gotta do my own work and, but it's not about me. And that is something that, um, to be quite honest, I still to this day have to work through when I feel triggered by something or we're talking about something. Cause like you said, we talk about a lot that I have to keep reminding myself his, this is this is a Corey issue that he brought into the marriage that yes affects me but it's not about me and so I have to 
make sure that I'm reminding myself that he does still love me and he is attracted to me and I am everything that I'm supposed to be to him and whatever it was that was causing this or whatever the root of that is, it's not my fault and it's not because of anything I am or am not doing. It is something that he brought into this. And I think in the beginning, I was feeling like, well, if I could just do this, and if I could just do this, and if I did this, then maybe he wouldn't. And I found myself on this hamster wheel trying to be this savior for this issue that he had that I was never going to save him from. And um, that is probably, to me, the, the, the greatest thing that I learned and and as again as painful as it was for the counselor because I, at the beginning I, it, I was making this how could you do this to me and how could you blah 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 and not realizing at the time that it was a sickness that he was struggling with and I would never look at him if he had cancer and be like well how could you how could you do this to my family how could you do this to me and so I'm not, I was not perfect at it then, I'm not perfect at it now, but it is something that when I have to go and do my work and remind myself that it's not about me, it is probably something that I will have to constantly remind myself of and that's okay. Statistics, you know what I'm trying to say. Statistically, um, conservatively even, would tell us that about a little less than half of this room struggles with the internet. And what I had to come to realize with my struggle with the internet is that, back to the boundaries thing, I have to put boundaries in place. Um, at home, if I wanna watch anything above TV 14, my wife has put a code in that I don't know. And, and as a man, and especially in our, in our sort of, and you referenced it earlier, sort of this toxic masculinity world we live in, we're like, I'm, I'm a man, I'm not gonna have my wife put no code in for me. Hey, good luck with that, bro. You know, that, 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 that there's, I had to get over this, this macho man feeling that I needed help. I needed help. I have covenant eyes on my phone. My wife has the passwords to everything, um, which, and to be honest, we still have those moments where like, I'm like, you know, where she'll ask a question. I'm like, well, why are you in my phone? Like, you know, that, that thing the dudes do, you know, like we try to change the subject. Like, well, well, before we get to that, why are you in my phone to begin with? <laughs> well, you gave me the password, but yeah, but I mean, you, you just go through my stuff whenever you feel like it. But there are things that as men, and, 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 and I'm not going to act like, we won't talk like it's only men who struggle with the internet. As, as human beings in general, um, your partner's there to help you. And if you can have open lines of communication and allow yourself to be vulnerable enough to let someone see who you are, because one of the biggest issues that we had um, in, in our marriage early on for me was, and even at times still, is it's hard to let somebody love you without you trying to do something to earn it. We are constantly trying to prove that we're lovable trying to be funny, trying to be witty, trying to look good, trying to smell good, trying to perform well. All these things that we're doing all the time and we're, we're constantly doing those things to be loved. But in a relationship and in a partnership, it's not only that you are offering love to someone, but you're willing to receive love, to let someone see all of the warts and everything that there is about you that's ugly and that you don't want anybody else to see, that you would never put on an Instagram selfie. But you are with a partner, they get to see you. And you have to be willing to allow them to love you and sometimes allowing them to love you is them asking you tough questions that you don't like to answer and you being vulnerable enough to say, here's why, and here's who I am. So do you want to say any last words before, before we close? No. You don't want to say anything before we close? Okay. Well, I, I just want to say this to, to anyone in the room that like has, you, you may be struggling in your marriage now. You may know someone who is struggling in their marriage. You may be someone who's decided you're never gonna get married at all, but you're still struggling, period. Um, I just, again, I want you to know there's hope for you. And not hope because you're gonna go home and do the stuff that we said, and now your marriage is gonna be totally better, because that's not true. We have things that have worked for us. It does not necessarily mean that it will work for you. But as Pastor Mike said earlier, that's so brilliant. We can get caught up in the don't ever do this and always do this. 
and then one day you do the thing that you're never supposed to do or you don't do the thing you're always supposed to do and you go, well, now what? You just keep going. We're not still married because either one of us is some super Christian person. 50% of all marriages end in divorce. In church, out of church, doesn't matter. But when you commit to saying this is a death do me part situation, you commit to that and you just stick with it and you, you cry yourself to sleep sometimes, you leave the house sometimes, you sleep on the couch sometimes, but whatever you have to do to stay committed to that, you do that. And when you come to the place, or if you come to the place where neither or both of you or one of you is like, I can't make this commitment any, any longer, be grace, have the grace and the mercy and the compassion for the other person to be honest about that. Because the worst thing you can do to someone you're supposed to love is to be inauthentic and act like you're still living in a way that, and in a commitment that you truly are no longer committed to. So, can I pray? Can I pray for you? Can I pray for you? Let's close your eyes. Let's, let's pray together. God, we are thankful that love covers a multitude of sins and love really does lift us. When nothing else could help, when nothing else could make us whole, your love has done that for us. And I pray today that everyone in this room would know that first and foremost, your love can make us whole, but also that the love we offer one another can bring wholeness as well. And I pray for the person in this room who may think that they're unlovable, that they would know at this church and in this, in this room and there are people in this space who they can be authentically themselves with and still find that people still love them. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Thanks for having us.